All right, we are going to get started. What a beautiful day we have this morning, or this afternoon, I guess it is. You know, yesterday it was raining and cold, and God just pushed it on through and gave us such a beautiful day. In Oklahoma, this time of the year, and I guess anywhere in the United States, you never know what you're going to get. Uh, we do these at different capitals throughout the United States, and we've had snow, and we've had rain, and uh, we've been in Nashville, we've been chased out by tornadoes. So uh, we've been we've been all over and through all sorts of weather, and uh, we just we just thank each and every one of you for being a part and coming out to our to our first annual Oklahoma City Bible Reading Marathon. It is such a pleasure for Seedline International to be able to come out and to be able to partner with with different ministries and different pastors here in Oklahoma that really have a burden for God's word. And, uh, and our chaplains here at the state house, they have a burden for God's word there in our state houses, along with our legislators that uh, that are there. And uh, we pray for them often. And we pray that, that God will give them the wisdom of David and the heart or the wisdom of Solomon and the heart of David to know how to um, handle the laws and handle the bills that come up, but also the heart to serve the people and to be there for the people. So we pray often for them, and uh, we just want to take this time to cover our capital because we know God's word is powerful. He says it's powerful. We've seen it, it's, and uh, it will not return void. It will prosper where he sends it, and it will accomplish whatever he wants it to accomplish. And so uh, we are excited to be able to do this. You cannot do this on any capital anywhere in any other country. And God has given us the freedoms to be able to do that and the responsibility to, uh, to share his word and to read his word. So we are excited about this and about being here in Oklahoma City for the next 90 hours, 90 hours God's word will be read and covered over our state capitol here in Oklahoma City. And uh, we read all through the night. So uh, if you're listening online and uh, you wanna be part of this, you can sign up on our website. It's probably going across the ticker right now, across the bottom. Um, anybody that has a hard time sleeping, well, I'm sure we have open spots throughout the night. And uh, the people that are chuckling understand because they're part of our team and they know we have open spots throughout the night. So uh, you're more than welcome to come out. And I encourage people to come out, uh, not just during the night, but all the time. For one, you don't have to fight with the traffic trying to get in here. Uh, that's uh, in other states, that's, that's a big thing where you fight with traffic, but, uh, probably here in Oklahoma city, you might have to fight with it during the daytime. And, uh, another thing is, is it, it is very safe. It is safe being under the umbrella of God's word while we're reading here at our Capitol. So we're excited about this. We're excited to see what God's going to do over the next 90 hours, the hearts and lives that he's going to touch. And, uh, we're real thankful for, um, again, for this privilege, but for uh, a, a special group of people, uh, the Uncells, they work with uh, international, or um, sorry, Intercessories for America. And what it is, is a prayer group that, uh, that prays for our, cap for our legislators at our capitals. So I've asked uh, David Uncell if he'll come and open us in a word of prayer this morning or this afternoon. Lord, we come, we'll come before you, we humble ourselves, we thank you for the opportunity and the freedom to read your word and to spread it across this capital and across the state. And we pray, Lord, that you would loose your angels over us, that, Lord, there would be a edge of protection that nothing could stop this, could not hinder one person from coming and feeling your presence. We pray that when people drive by or walk by, they will feel your presence mightily. They will be drawn in and say, what is going on? And they will want to be a part. And that, Lord God, we know that your word is living and active and powerful, and it will never fall to the ground before, without it. It will never fall to the ground. It will always return to you and fulfill your purpose. So we pray for your word to go throughout this state to touch legislators, to touch everybody, and that, Lord God, we pray we will see a dramatic improvement 
in our thoughts and our minds and our speech, but we also pray that you would work in us as individuals, that through this experience, we will be changed. We will grow in you. We will become more bold, but we will also become more humble. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You know, um, we know God enjoys music. He enjoys to hear us sing. Yeah, he, he tells us that, uh, that he enjoys our, our singing and lifting our voices and making a joyful noise. He doesn't always say making a, a good noise because I know when I, when I sing, I, I, I tell my wife I sing solo. Solo, nobody hears me. And so uh, he likes to hear a joyful noise. And I was talking with Uncells about this whole program and, and what we do. And, uh, and I said, um, you know, we, we like to have a time of singing and, and a time of uh, some special music that may take place. And uh, he goes, I've got, some, I've got some special people that lead worship at a church. And I think you'd really enjoy hearing some of the songs and some of the music that they may have for us. So uh, we're going we're gonna to move right through and we're going to ask Jed and Jesse Salee if they'll, uh, if they'll sing a couple of songs for us and, um, and just minister in music to our hearts. Go ahead. You might know America the Beautiful and have great power. Thank 
Thank you. You know, God is great. In the last few years since uh, my wife and I, Tarla, have been, uh, have been doing these Bible reading marathons, I've really, really seen the timing of God and how God just times things out perfect and how great he is. He amazes me so much. You know, his, uh, in Galatians 4, it tells us, in the fullness of time, God, and then it goes on, sent forth his son. But just that little phrase, in the fullness of time, God. And how he lines things up. And uh, we were down here uh, a, a couple of months ago, back in November, getting the word out and stopping by different churches and, and leaving information. And there was a church out in Yukon that I had come across the website on, and uh, um, Harvest Hills Baptist Church. And I wanted to get out to there, but I just ran out of time. And uh, I was down, we, we were down in Louisiana. And uh, our rep down there in Louisiana that's asked us to come down was helping with us. And we were talking with him. And he said, well, have you connected with a pastor named Pastor Shirk? And I said, no. And I said, where is he at? And where is he from? And he said, well, he's from Harvest Hills Baptist Church in Yukon, Oklahoma. <laughs> I'm like, really? 
I said, that's interesting because I wanted to connect with that church. I was on his website. I listened to, or I read a few of his blogs that he had on his website. And I said, I really wanted to get out there and talk to him. And he goes, here, here's his personal cell number. I'll send him a text and you can call him. He'll be looking for you. <laughs> so God lines things up so much in the fullness of time. We see that so often in our readings that uh, somebody will walk by and, uh, and come up and, and, and sign up to read. And we don't, we don't sign up for passages. We sign up for times. And they'll get up here and they'll say, you know what? That was my favorite verse that I got to read. I don't know how that happened. I signed up you know, for, for four in the afternoon on a Tuesday. And I just got to read that verse. Or this last year in, uh, in West Virginia, we had a judge came up and uh, he came out to read and uh, he stepped off and we got to talk for a few minutes. And he said, you know, I got to read there in, uh, in First Kings where Solomon was praying for wisdom, wisdom of how to judge the people. And he says, that's my prayer every day. But we get that so often. God times things and lines things up so much. And so I was talking with Pastor Shirk and uh, we got together. And I said, hey, would you like to come out and be part of our opening ceremony? And he says, sure, I would be glad. So I would like Pastor Shirk of, of Harvest Hills Baptist Church to come out and give, just give us a challenge of God's word and uh, what God's led on his heart today. I want to thank Brother Bavar for giving me the opportunity to be here. I think what we're doing today is, is immensely important to get the word of God before our politicians and here in the capital, because to be honest, if our our nation is ever going to see any kind of change, it is going to have to come because of God. We could talk about all kinds of political answers to the problems that we face, but those are really just band-aids covering up a deeper problem that our nation faces. And our, our main focus th during this Bible reading marathon is obviously the Word of God, and, and the main text that Brother Bavar mentioned that we would be uh, putting a special emphasis on is Psalm 119, which if you know anything about Psalm 119, this is a passage that speaks about the Word of God. Almost every single Bible verse in Psalm 119 deals with the Word of God. And when I was asked to do a, a challenge from this text, you, you've always got to ask yourself, okay, well, what is the challenge going to be? you got to know who your audience is. That's a big part of it, right? Um, but really, I want to encourage us with the importance of the Word of God for our, for our nation from Psalm 119. And we're going to start in verse 41. I'm just reading one, one section through here, Psalm 119, verse 41 through 48, which says, Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. And take not the, the word of the truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings, and will not be ashamed. I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. And as we look at, at this psalm here, each of these sections are divided up um, with just a few verses all together, but uh, each of them has kind of a common theme within them. And in this section, I see that the author of this, of this psalm specifically points out at the very beginning that there is a need that needs to be met, the need of the hour. In verse 41, let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. And so David begins by making a request. And we request things that, that we need all the time. When in these hot Oklahoma summer days, right? You got your kids out in the backyard, they're, they're playing and they're digging in the dirt. I don't know if your kids like to play in the dirt like mine do, but uh, they're, play, they're working up a sweat and then they come in from a hot day out in the sun and they need something, but what do they need? They need a glass of water, right? Okay. There is something that America needs, that Oklahoma needs, that our politicians need, our Christians need, and that is God and his word. It is essential that we have these things in our nation. Um, as we were praying earlier, we, we prayed about and talked about this, the idea that our nation was founded on biblical principles. But it has been a long time since our politicians have cared one, one way or the other about biblical principles. And those biblical principles are essential 
for a, for a government to run and to operate the way that it ought to. And so here, as we're doing this Bible reading marathon, we are taking the opportunity to try to get God's word before people's eyes to remind them that they need God's word in their lives. But David here, he needs mercy. And I think in America, we need, we need God's mercy, God's covenant love to be manifested in our, in our lives. It's a love that's based on a committed relationship with his people, and it's dependable. Um, my wife knows that when she's down and sick, she has me to be able to be there to help take care of her. Because 14 years ago, we made a covenant between us. When we, when we said our wedding vows, we made a promise to be there for each other. God's covenant love with his people, we need, we need that mercy that comes from that kind of a relationship with, with our God. But he also says here that we need salvation. He needed salvation. And God's faithfulness, God's love is evidenced by his saving David from the evil that David was facing. He was going through a lot of difficult times. And our nation has been recently through a lot of difficult times. And we need God to rescue us from those things. But more than that, we need more than just physical safety, more than just physical salvation. We need spiritual salvation. Our nation needs to be returned back to God. And he also seeks here an answer from God. Even thy salvation according to thy word. But he needed an answer to give to those who accused him, who are standing against him. And Christianity has suffered a loss in the face of our culture today, has it not? And in, 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 in the world around us, Christianity is no longer looked at as, as a redeeming influence on in our culture. Uh, the, the world looks at Christianity with, with skepticism, and they see the things that, that have crept into our churches that are not correct, that need to be corrected. And so the church has suffered a loss of face before our culture today. And what the world really needs right now is to see the reality of Christianity lived out in the lives of the people who claim to love the Lord. And so David was faced with a great need. In America, we're facing a similar need. We need Christians and we need Christian politicians who will stand up and who will do what the Lord has commanded and will seek his face and will unashamedly take a stand for what is right and will point men to Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. What this world needs right now is Jesus Christ. So he begins by making a request because they have a great need. But the solution to the, to the problem in this text is found in verse 42. So have I with, so shall I wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. When David was faced with his greatest need, he turned to the one place where he could get help, where he, where he could find the hope that he needed. And that hope was found in God's word. And God's word gives us guidance. Our politicians need that. They need guidance to know how to make right decisions. They, God's word gives us comfort. When we're hurting, when there are tragedies in our communities, where do people turn in those moments? They need God's word for that. God's word can give us the strength or the courage to stand when others are standing against us. And God remind, God's word reminds us of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So David makes his request. He finds his, the solution to his problem in the word of God. And then he pursues the word of God. And it, in this text, I went through and I underlined all the different things that David says he's going to do with the word of God. In verse 42, he says, I will trust in thy word. He puts his faith, his dependence, his trust in it. Verse 43, he, he says, I have hoped in thy judgments. He finds hope there. In verse 44, he says, I will keep or I will obey repetitively thy law continually. And then he says, I will walk at liberty. And I found that one to be important because we talk all the time about liberty in America. It's one of the pillars that America was founded on. But and oftentimes in our minds, liberty means the freedom to do whatever I want, right? But that isn't actually what liberty really is about. We pride ourselves on freedom in America. But when you read words like commandments or law or statutes, we oftentimes don't think of freedom. But true freedom does not lie in doing whatever you want. Do you think a drug addict actually feels free because he's doing what he wants to do? No, he is still in bondage. And rather, he needs to find true freedom, not outside the law, but rather through it. And that is why the, the word of God is so important, because there is a moral standard before God. 
and true freedom is expressed and found in those things. He says that he will seek God's word in verse uh, 45. Then he says he will speak of it. How many, how many of us are bold to speak the truth of God's word when we know that others are going to think we're crazy, maybe a little bit weird, but we're willing to stand up and we're willing to speak about it? Our politicians probably feel a pressure every single day to keep their mouth shut about their faith because they, they w- don't want anybody else to think that they're, they're a crazy person. But can you be af- afraid? Could you imagine being afraid to introduce your wife at a party? It's kind of the same thing with being afraid of our Lord Jesus Christ to stand up and to boldly proclaim the word of God. We're basically saying that we're ashamed of that relationship that we have with him. And so we need to speak and we need to speak boldly. But David also says, I will delight. He finds his joy, his greatest happiness in the word of God. And then he says, I will meditate in thy statutes. Meditation is this idea of continually bringing it to mind and thinking about it. And you do that because it's important to you. It's, it, it's something that it, it impacts every single decision that you make. It's always on your mind. But here on these, on these capital steps, we are endeavoring to remind the state of Oklahoma and our politicians that the hope of the world is found in this book. But there is a greater truth in this passage that sometimes I think floats just under the surface. There's no magic in just merely the words of the book, right? The, the words read on these steps will not make things better merely because we gathered here today all on their own. This book was not written to make you smarter. It was not me- meant to make you more religiously inclined or to merit God's favor in some way. If you stop and take a look at Psalm 119, again, I said, we, t- we say it's about the word of God because that's, that word is repeated. The, the word word, commandment, statutes, they're repeated over and over and over again in Psalm 119. But there's actually a set of words that are repeated more often in Psalm 119. Those words are words like I or my. And and I think what what we see here is that David is not writing these words about the word of God to say the word of God is powerful and it changes things. It does do that. But David is actually expressing his relationship with God through the word. And that is actually the key. It is a relationship with God through the word. That, that's where the power comes from. That's where the impact is going ha- to come in our nation is when people see God in his word and their lives are transformed by it. Verses 41 through 48, repeat those words. I trust in thy word. Take not thy word of truth utterly out of my mouth. I have hopes in thy judgments. So he had a personal relationship with his God <clears throat> in the word. And so the only hope that we have in finding a true connection with our God is through the word that he has given us. And that is the hope that people need to to get out of what we are doing here on the steps of the Capitol today. It's not just about a book. It is about a God who gave us that book so we could have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Well, as we move from state to state throughout the United States, we're, uh, we're on seven different capitals, and um, we, can't, we can't do every capital without help inside each state, and we can't do every capital without help from, from regular individuals. So usually somebody from a different state will contact us and say, hey, we'd like for you to come in and be part of this. So while we're out there working and trying to, to, to build this up, we're we're connecting with different ministry leaders inside the state capitol and different pastors and different different ministry leaders just throughout the throughout the state. And uh, you may be asking, well, who are these twelve people that are back here? These are different ministry leaders throughout the throughout the Oklahoma, and some of them part of our team. And uh, we've reached out to them, and they said, yes, we believe God's word is that important. We believe God's word needs to be at our capitals. And uh, we'd like to be a part of you. So these aren't any, uh, they aren't any special people. I, I, not to burst anybody's bubble, but uh, they're all servants of God and, uh, and want God's word to go forth and affect the hearts and lives of the readers. And, you know, God's had a special heart or a place in his heart with, uh, with the children of Israel. So when, when I ask for our, our uh, leaders to come up, we ask for uh, 12 different leaders to kind of symbolize God's heart for the children of Israel and the 12 tribes. You know, and as, as Pastor Shirk was talking about, uh, God's word, desire 
in Psalms 119. And we've got some special readings that are going to come out of Psalms 19 here uh, with these different leaders. But just listen to how David's desire, his passion, his longing to be in God's word, to know it, to have it in his heart, to be able to live it out. And we in society have four Bibles here in America, five Bibles that sit in our our houses and never get opened. You know, we, we decide that we want to go to church when we want to go to church and, and not try to be there consistently. And, uh, and, and, and in God's house on every, every week. Uh, in, in being able to do these Bible reading marathons, I get to meet a lot of people and a lot of people from different countries. And uh, we just get to hear the heart of the people that are, that are persecuted for their faith. And have that desire and that hunger for God's word to be in their life and to know God. But here in America, it just seems like it's just so watered down. Well, I was talking with a a leader in Nashville, and 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 I was explaining this to her, and I said, it's time for us to get the Bible out of the four walls of the church and back out in front of our capital, in front of our people. And she goes, you know what? We need to get the Bible back in the four walls of our church because it doesn't seem like we have a desire for it anymore we preach our lessons we teach our lessons out of other people's books and what other people have written and not from the word of god so as as these 12 come up and they read a portion of god's word here in psalms 119 listen to david's passion that he has for the word of god and think about it do we have that same passion in our lives to have that same passion for God's word, to know it, to hunger for it, to desire for it, and to be in God's word every day. Brother David. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou shalt command us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word. I have sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Lord, may you be blessed. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I proclaim all the judgments from your mouth. I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and think about your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. I'm a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul is crushed with longing after your ordinances at all times. You rebuke the arrogant, the cursed, who wander from your commandments. Take away reproach and contempt from me, for I observe your testimonies. Even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight. My soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. I have declared my ways, and thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. 
so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Remove from me the way of lying, and grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I have stuck into unto thy testimonies. O oh Lord, put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Teach me, O oh Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant, who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach, which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Lord, give me my, give me your un, unfailing love. The salvation that, salvation that you promised me. Then I can answer those who taught me, for I trust in your word. Do not snatch your word of truth from me. For your regula regulations are my only hope. I will keep on obeying your in instructions forever and ever. And I will walk in freedom. For I love, for I have devoted myself to your commandments. I will speak to you to know about your laws, and I will not be ashamed. Hope I delight in your commands. How I love them. I honor and love your commands. I will meditate on your decree. Remember the word unto thy servant, unto which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. The proud have had me in greatly in derision, yet have I not declined from thy law. I remember thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night, and have kept thy law. This I had because I kept thy precepts. Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. The bands of the wicked have robbed me, but I have not forgotten thy law. At midnight I will rise and give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. 
The earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. I'll be reading out of my Choctaw Bible, so you might want to uh, follow along in the English. Your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding to learn your commands. May those who fear you rejoice when they see me, for I have put my hope in your word. I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. May your unfailing love be my comfort according to your promise to your servant. Let your compassion come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. May the arrogant be put to shame for wronging me without cause, but I will meditate on your precepts. May those who fear you turn to me, those who understand your statutes. May I wholeheartedly follow your decrees that I may not be put to shame. Uh, for, uh, <clears throat> my soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I've put my hope in your word. My eyes fail looking for your promise. I say, when will you comfort me? Though I am like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your decrees. How long must your servant wait? When will you punish my persecutors? The arrogant dig pitfalls for me contrary to your law all your commands are trustworthy help me for men persecute me without cause they almost wipe me from the earth but i have not forsaken your precepts preserve my life according to your love and i will obey your statutes of your mouth Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, 
for all are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. I will never forget thy precepts, for within them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought my, thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. You can see David's heart towards the word of God there and how his passion is to know it, to live it. He loves it. You know, we know that, uh, that, that God doesn't just speak English. He speaks multiple languages, and he loves to hear it in every language, and we do too. Whenever we come, we try to make it as accessible to any language as possible. We bring 104 different languages with us, and we enjoy it when we get to hear so many people in so many different languages read God's word because we get, we get just so used to it in our own language. But to hear somebody else hear it is, is fantastic. And uh, usually in Washington, D.C., we get to hear the most different languages when we're out there. But uh, when, when I was talking with the Uncells about coming here, and I said, wouldn't it be neat if we get to hear some, some of the Native American languages being read? And uh, she goes, well, I have just the people that will do that. And I said, wouldn't it be neat to be able to have some music, God-honoring music, in, in Native American language? And she goes, I have just the people that can do that. And I said, well, Carol, you know a lot of people, don't you? And she goes, well, I try. So uh, she, uh, she's connected with a, with a few ladies that are, that are going to come up and sing, Amer um, uh, what are they singing? Sorry, Amazing Grace in Choctaw, right? I believe that is. So uh, I, that is uh, Cheryl Whedon and Paula Carney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, ladies. Well, it's time. It's time to get started. It's time to start and kick off our Bible reading marathon here in Oklahoma City. And so uh, just because of, uh, of how much work they've done and how much they've uh, prepared the way here, I've asked uh, Carol Unsell if she'll come and start us in Genesis 1-1 to, uh, to open our reading. I told the Lord, I said, Lord, it'd be so neat if you'd let me read Genesis 1. <laughs> Ah, oh, thank you. God. Just one one. No, you can start and read a couple of chapters and we'll have somebody come up and read. Oh, okay. praise God. Yeah. Can I just use my Bible? That's fine. You can too. Okay. Isn't God amazing? Absolutely amazing. In the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Then God said, let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of the heavens. God called the space sky. And evening passed and morning came, marking the second day. Then God said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place. So dry ground may appear. And that is what happened. God called the dry ground land and the waters seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed bearing plant and trees that grow seed bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the third day. Then God said, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. 
Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. Let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And that is what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day and the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, to govern the day and night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And evening passed and morning came, marking the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each pr producing offspring of the same kind. Livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals the birds in the sky and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. 
in the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden and then dividing into four branches. The first branch called the Pishon flowed around the entire land of Havilah where gold is found. The gold of that land is exceptionally pure. Aromatic resin and onyx stone are also found there. The second branch called the Gihon flowed around the entire land of Cush. The third branch called the Tigris flowed east of the land of Asher. The fourth branch is called the Euphrates. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still, there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains, <clears throat> excuse me, why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame.